Welcome everyone. It's great to have so many people here today. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. My name's uh, Dr. Artita Das. I'm a consultant psychiatrist and I'm the specialist advisor to the, uh, to the Royal College on Foundation Training. And I'll be chairing today's webinar on applying to core uh, psychiatry training. Um, so hopefully all of you are here today because you're interested in applying to core training in psychiatry starting uh, hopefully in August 2023. We've got a great lineup of speakers. Um, firstly, we've got uh, Amelia O'Donnell, who's the head of recruitment based at HE Northwest, but covers its national recru recruitment covering uh, all of um, England. Uh, and we've also got Dr. James Dugan, who's a core trainee, who's going to talk to you a little bit about working as a core trainee, and he, he himself has been through the application process as well. So a little bit about the sort of the do's and the don'ts from a sort of trainee perspective. Um, just a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, I'm not going to talk for too long. I'll get, hand you over to Amelia very soon. Um, the uh, slides for all the speakers will be available uh, on the website uh, after the meeting. Um, as you may have noticed, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will also be available afterwards and certificates of attendance will be sent out within a week of the webinar itself. Now, um, most of the speakers aren't going to be speaking very long, probably about 10, 15 minutes, just to take you through some of the processes and procedures. Uh, from past experience, what do you all want to do is ask loads of questions. So we've allowed a lot of time at the end for questions, and we're also joined for the question and answer session uh, by Dr. Chris Walsh, who's the head of the Psychiatric Trainees Committee. Um, so if you do want to ask questions, which I'm sure many of you do, can you make sure and put the, to put them into the Q&A function, not into the chat. You can absolutely use the chat function to talk to each other, make comments, you know, whatever you want to do. But if you do have specific questions for the speakers or just about processes, make sure you put it into the Q&A box where they'll be picked up. Amelia and her colleague Ben will be working hard behind the scenes to try and answer as many as they can. Um, we'll also try and answer as many as we can live as well. Some of them are quite specific, so those will be answered you know, um, on the chat. If you do see a question in the Q&A box that you were thinking of asking or is very similar to the question you want to ask, if you like it, it will move up the order and those questions which are particularly popular or um, seem people want, seem to, want to know about will try and answer live uh, rather than lots of answers which are very similar repeatedly. Um, so that's kind of all I had to say. Finally, um, if you do, if you are on Twitter and you want to tweet about it, um, if you tweet at RC Psych, hashtag RC Psych Live, those will also be picked up. Great to kind of get that going as well if you're interested. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. I'm going to hand you over to uh, Amelia now as National Recruitment Manager. Thanks very much, Amelia. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the recruitment process. Uh, so if I can have the next slide, please. Uh, so as an overview, I'll talk about 2023 recruitment, a quick overview of the process, the posts that are involved, the eligibility requirements, the online application process, um, ways of showing foundation competency, the MSRA, the multi-specialty recruitment assessment, preferences and offers, and I'll finish with some key dates. Can I have the next slide, please? So for the 2023 recruitment round, we'll continue with the process that was agreed for August 2021, um, which was kind of devised when COVID-19 started. We don't anticipate any changes to the process for the August 23 or February 24 intake. So to confirm, there will be no face-to-face -face interviews or online interviews, and there's no requirement for applicants to provide any portfolio evidence to support their application. Applicants will be ranked using the MSRA only, um, the MSRA is a reliable and valid way of assessing a large number of candidates in a standardised way with limited clinician and administrative resource, and it's a globally accessible process on a robust technological platform. We've used it for several years now. It's been fully evaluated and we have evidence of good correlation between the MSRA and interview scores, which includes communication, and we have evidence that it predicts subsequent performance in psychiatry training. 
Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, so this is an overview of, of what you'll need to do. So you'll need to register and apply for core psychiatry on the Oriel system. You'll need to possibly respond to long listing queries, book and sit the MSRA exam, complete your preferences, which um, involves putting the available posts in order of preference, and hopefully responding to offers. If I can have the next slide, please. Uh, so this is an overview of the anticipated posts. Um, at the moment, there are only 286 posts that we've received, um, but there's um, we expect it to be much higher. So as you can see, KSS, London and Wessex, they haven't yet declared their numbers. And also we're expecting um, some further posts of the expansion posts once the funding has been confirmed. So this is in no way a final number. Um, we expect it to increase throughout, well, between now and March. <laughs> if I can have the next slide, please. Uh, so I'll now talk about eligibility requirements. So you can find the person specification on our website and that outlines the requirements. So applicants must have a recognized primary medical qualification. They must be eligible for full GMT registration with the current license to practice. Um, and that's at the time the post starts rather than the time of application. Applicants must have 24 months experience, including at least 12 months experience post registration. And that can be either in the UK or overseas. Um, applicants must be eligible to work in the UK. Um, they need evidence of English language skills and evidence of achievement of foundation competency. And as a reminder, there's no limit to the amount of previous psychiatry experience you can have. Um, Next slide, please. Uh, so how to apply. All applications must be submitted via the Oriel system. I've included a link there. Uh, to be considered for CT1 Psychiatry and the two run-through programmes of ST1 Child Adolescent Psychiatry and ST1 Psychiatry of Learning Disability, you need to submit a single application. So if you search for core psychiatry training on the Oriel system. Then further along in the process, you'll have the opportunity to rank all of the available posts, so core psychiatry and the run-throughs, um, in order of preference. To be considered for this round, you need to submit an application between um, now and uh, 4 p.m. UK time on Thursday, 1st of December. The application window opened earlier today. We'd advise you to submit your application well before the closing date as late or incomplete applications will not be accepted. And further information can be found on our core psychiatry website, where there's also an applicant's guide. Can I have the next slide, please? So moving on to the online application, it's a very simple system. The form will ask for your personal information, qualification and employment details, and your referee details. There are no white space box questions. Um, but depending on your circumstances, you might need to provide some supporting information. And if that is the case, the application form will prompt you to provide that evidence. Um, the applications will be long listed by a recruitment team to check that you meet the relevant entry requirements. Um, it will not be shortlisted. And so during the long listing period, if we have any questions about your application, we might contact you to request that extra further information or evidence. So we'd recommend regularly checking your Oriel accounts for updates. Um, and at the end of the long listing process, all applicants who meet the requirements will receive a message to confirm that their application has been long listed. And we expect that will be mid-December sort of time this year. If I can have the next slide, please. So as I mentioned, during the long listing period, you might be asked to provide some further information or evidence. And these are some examples of them. So if you've requested reasonable adjustments, you will need to attach evidence of the, of the adjustment. Um, for example, an educational psychologist report recommending extra time or whatever the adjustment you would like, uh, we would need supporting evidence and that needs to be at the time of application. Uh, similarly, there's a special circumstances process. So if you're the primary carer of someone who's disabled, or if you yourself have medical condition or a disability which requires you to stay in the same location, then you can submit a request for the special circumstances process. It's managed centrally 
and some further information is included on the specialty training website there for you to look into. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So to continue, um, if you've previously been released or resigned from a course psychiatry training program in the UK, or if you're a current course psychiatry trainee who's reapplying in the hope that they'll be able to work in a different region, then you need to provide a completed reapplication to specialty form. And I've included a link there to the specialty training website. Um, similarly, if you answer yes to any of the fitness to practice questions, then you'll need to complete a declaration and that needs to be sent to a secure email address, which I've included there, the fitness practice one, um, by the closing date. The date there is wrong. Uh, obviously, that should be 22. Um, that's not going to impact your application. We just need to request the information from you. And finally, uh, foundation competency evidence. So if you're if you aren't currently in a UK affiliated foundation program, you'll need to attach some evidence of your foundation competency. Um, I'll explain in a few minutes what that could possibly be. Uh, so if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, so this is um, a section about the foundation competency. So the person specifications for entry to all CT1, ST1 specialty training programs require applicants to provide evidence of their achievement of foundation competency. So if you're a current trainee, you would provide your NTN in the application form. Um, if you're a current FY2 trainee, you would include your DRN and the name of your foundation school in the application form. And in the case of those FY2 trainees, any offer will be conditional upon you successfully completing your foundation program and being awarded an FPCC by August 2023. Um, so if you're a trainee who's finished foundation quite recently, within 3.5 years of the pro start date, you can provide your FPCC as evidence of foundation competency. So it would have to be dated since 1st of January. If you're a previous foundation trainee, but you completed it more than three and a half years ago, you'll need to provide a CREST, which is a certificate of readiness to enter specialty training, just to show that you've met and maintained all of those foundation competencies. And uh, finally, anyone who's not in a training program in the UK um, would need to provide a CREST. If I could have the next slide, please. Uh, so to explain what the CREST is, it's a, a competency certificate that maps the foundation program curriculum, and it must be signed off by somebody who supervised you for a continuous period of three months since the 1st of January 2020. So that can be your educational or clinical supervisor. Um, it doesn't have to relate to a post in the UK or a post in the NHS. Um, that's often asked. Uh, so please make sure that you use the 2021 version of the CREST and you submit one fully completed certificate. You can't submit several from different posts. And there's some detailed guidance available on the specialty training website about how to fill that form in. If I could have the next slide, please. Uh, so there are several things that we collect and we pass on information wise uh, from your application form. So following um, a successful offer that you've accepted, we'll pass this information on. Uh, so you can request a deferred start date in your application form, um, but only for statutory reasons such as ill health or parental leave. Um, so if you request that, it'll have no impact on the offer process, but that information, that request will be passed on to your recruiting region who will confirm and make a decision. Um, similarly, you can request, you can indicate that you wish to be considered for less than full time training in your application form, and that request will be passed on to your recruiting region. Um, you can also indicate in your application form if you wish your previous training experience to be considered. It's possible to reduce your time in training in your course psychiatry training program if you have experience in a UK GP, IMT paediatrics or public health training programs. That decision would be made by your recruiting region. It wouldn't be made by the recruitment team there. Um, and finally, if you require a visa to take up your post, your immigration information will be shared with a central recruitment team. 
uh, sponsorship team, sorry, um, and they'll contact you to provide the necessary forms for you to complete. If I could have the next slide, please. Uh, so moving on, uh, the MSRA, the Multi-Specialty Recruitment Assessment, is a computer-based test and it will make up your final score for the August 2023 intake. It's used by a number of specialties. So if you're applying for several others, maybe GP, you only need to sit the exam once and it will count for all of those specialties. There are two papers. Uh, so the Professional Dilemmas paper is 95 minutes and that focuses on your approach to practicing medicine. Each scenario encapsulates a professional dilemma and you're asked about dealing with it. The paper is designed to assess your understanding of appropriate behaviour for a doctor in difficult situations. And secondly, the clinical problem solving paper, which presents clinical scenarios and requires you to exercise judgment and problem solving skills to determine appropriate diagnosis and management of patients. It's not a test of knowledge, but rather your ability to apply it appropriately. If I could have the next slide, please. Uh, so following the long listing period, all eligible applicants will be invited to sit the MSRA test. We expect it will be delivered between the 5th of January and the 17th of January at Pearson View test centres, both in the UK and globally. Um, remote testing provisions can be put into place as a reasonable adjustment and for those who are perhaps isolating or shielding in line with uh, public health advice due to COVID-19 or depending on where they're based, any local or national lockdown measures relating to COVID-19 as well. Um, but in the first instance, you will be invited to a test centre. And then if you fall into one of the categories I mentioned above, you might be asked to complete the form to request to take the test remotely. I hope that makes sense. Um, in the event of significant disruptions to testing during the scheduled window due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the MSRA can be delivered remotely to all applicants. So if you've set the MSRA previously, um, unfortunately, you won't be able to carry your score forward to this round. As I said, for the August 23 intake, you have to sit the MSRA in January 2023 in the window that's mentioned there. Um, some information on how to prepare for the MSRA, including some example questions, can be found on our website as well. If I could have the next slide, please. Uh, so moving on to offers. Um, as I mentioned earlier, anticipated vacancy numbers have been published on our website. At the moment, they're incomplete, but we're hoping to have some information from the other regions, and they'll be added there in the coming weeks. Further along in the process, we expect February 2023, applicants will have the opportunity to rank all of the available posts in order of preference. Um, and in order of preference, sorry. Um, so applicants must achieve the minimum raw score on each MSRA paper to be eligible for an offer. Um, so as I said earlier, applicants will not be invited to attend an interview offers will just be based, made based on the MSRA score alone. No other evidence or information will be considered. We expect that initial offers will be made in early March, but by Thursday 30th of March at the very latest, and applicants will have 48 hours to respond to any offer. So you can accept, decline or hold your offer. Um, we'll explain this process obviously to the, the involved candidates further along in the process. Uh, but the whole deadline is 1 p.m. on Tuesday, 4th of April. And following that, we will continue to recycle the offers until no further movement, until all the posts have been allocated. Um, and applicants will be able to update their preferences between those recycling of offers. If I could have the next slide, please. Uh, so here's a quick summary of the key dates. Uh, so you'll need to submit your application between now and Thursday 1st of December at 4 p.m. Um, we hope to wrap up the long listing by the 12th of December and invite applicants to arrange their MSRA exam before Christmas, so by Tuesday the 20th of December. The MSRA test window will be between Thursday the 5th and Tuesday the 17th of January. We expect preferencing to take place in February with offers released in March and then hopefully people will start their posts in August 2023. Uh, can I have the last slide, please? 
Uh, so there'll be an opportunity to ask some questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, but if you'd like to contact us directly, um, our email address is psychiatryrecruitment.nw at hu.nhsuk. And we'll be able to help you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Amelia. And as uh, Amelia said, she'll be sticking around for uh, a Q&A live uh, a little bit later. And I know Ben's all been already at work answering a lot of your questions and Amelia will also be doing that as well uh, behind the scenes. So thank you so much for coming today. Um, next, we've got Dr. Jim Dugan, uh, who's a core trainee. Uh, Jim studied graduate entry medicine after previously working as a scientist for several years. He's originally from Yorkshire and decided to move closer to home for the foundation programme. He completed F1 and F2 in South Yorkshire and was successful for applying in applying for core psychiatry training in the same region. He is currently a CT2 working in an adult community mental health team in Rotherham, having previously um, completed his CT1 year in Barnsley. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Jim. Uh, thanks so much, Jim, for talking to us today. Thanks and, and hello, everybody. Um, so, yeah, first caveat, really, I suppose, is the fact that I'm a CT2, not a CT1. So it's a couple of years since I uh, since I applied for core training. Um, but I applied to start in August 2021 and the process uh, for the application back then was exactly the same as it is now. So nothing's changed, I don't believe, since that time. Um, I also had, a, you know, I had a, a very routine sort of route into core training. So I went to a UK medical school. Uh, did the foundation program uh, in the UK and I went straight into core training and I realised that there'll almost certainly be some people here today um, who might have a slightly different route in and who might have, have studied medicine overseas for example so um, so I apologise if this is sort of focused very much from, from my perspective but I suppose uh, um, it's a start. So just a few thoughts really I mean we, we heard a lot of detail there in the last talk about, about what to expect in the application process I would say, you know, probably the single most important thing is to, to really take a note of those dates in terms of the application windows uh, and deadlines that, that you'll need to meet. That's, you know, that's of absolute crucial importance. Um, from memory, the Oriel system is relatively straightforward. It's possibly not the most intuitive websites, but I, I don't think I had any problems with it. Um, as we heard at the, on the application form, there are no white box, no white space questions. And I do remember having a slightly uncomfortable feeling pressing the submit form uh, on the application form because I felt like I'd not really entered very much information. It was just factual information, really, um, showing my eligibility to apply. So there's no personal statement. There's nothing like that that you have to upload. And as we heard, the, the ranking in terms of ranking everybody who applies to decide who, who gets into which scheme, uh, that's entirely based on the MSRA score. So I thought I'd, I'd use a significant chunk of my a lot of 10 minutes to talk about the MSRA, um, what I did to prepare and just anecdotally what I've heard other people say about how they prepared. So I, I don't mind admitting that I didn't prepare very much for the MSRA. Um, you know, I was a, a busy F2 doctor and, um, and didn't think I really needed to. However, I would say that having not really prepared very much, I, I ended up going to the exam and finding the exam a bit harder than I <laughs> expected to, as you might imagine. Um, I think the amount that people prepare varies really widely, actually. I, I've heard anecdotally some people who apply for GP training had to do the MSRA, saying that they'd spent a couple of days at most preparing. And I've got one friend at the moment on core training who spent weeks and weeks and weeks preparing. It's going to come down partly to your personality, I suppose, and, and how comfortable you are studying, how much time you have, but also based on your, your particular needs. My thoughts are that the, uh, the clinical part of the MSRA, so the clinical problem solving section, the depth of knowledge that you're expected to have is very much in keeping with the depth of knowledge that you need to, uh, to do the foundation program um, or, or an internship you know, in another country. Uh, it's, it's very much general medical knowledge. I would say certainly from my experience of medical school final exams, the depth of knowledge for the MSRA was a bit less, I would say, the medical school finals, a tiny bit less. Um, the difficulty, I think, on the clinical part comes from the breadth of the knowledge that you are expected to have. Um, certainly, I, I remember when I sat the MSRA, um, it, it became clear to me 
in the exam uh, how little paediatrics knowledge I remembered from medical school and I didn't do a paediatrics uh, placement in foundation. Um, and, I, and I think the other questions were where I really genuinely had no clue um, I, uh, and had to just guess blind. I think they were all re related to paediatrics. Um, what I would suggest, I think certainly most people in the UK anyway, um, probably sign up for an online question bank to help them study. It's a very time efficient way of studying, um, but you do have to pay for them. Um, I, I'm not going to say which one I used, but I used a very popular one. It was one that we used at medical school a lot that all my friends used, uh, and they have an MSRA course. The one I used was very reasonably priced. I think it was about £25 um, for a few months access. The good thing about online question banks, or, or you could get a book, um, a book of sample questions, for example, but the good thing about doing that is you can you can do a whole load of the questions from different topic areas and you can identify which areas are your weak points or your blind spots. And then I would say to save time, because you'll have other commitments, try and focus in on, on the areas where, where your knowledge is, is perhaps a little bit more lacking. Certainly in terms of the sort of general medicine questions, they were they were in keeping with the kind of knowledge that I was using on a daily basis, really, as an F1 and F2 doctor. Um, and, and there probably wouldn't have been much point in me spending time studying um, the sort of general medicine, but things like paediatrics, reproductive health, um, ENT, ophthalmology, you know, there aren't loads of questions on, on each of those areas in the MSRA, but, but they will be in there. Um, and if those feel like weak points, then I'd spend a bit of time studying those and to get a feel for the depth of, of knowledge that you might need. The other part of the MSRA is the, the professional dilemmas section, as we've just heard. That's a lot more difficult to prepare for, I would say, and I'd probably, this is just my personal opinion, but I would discourage people probably from doing loads and loads of, of, uh, of questions on online question banks, because um, you can end up sort of getting a slightly wrong impression, I think, of what they're looking for. One thing I would say is that uh, the HEE website does have quite a detailed section on the MSRA, and I would say definitely read through that. Um, it explains the the both parts of the exam quite clearly, but certainly it does explain what, what the professional dilemmas section um, is testing, what domains it's testing. And it does have some example questions on there. Um, please don't all roll your eyes, but I would say as part of your preparation for the professional dilemmas part, it's probably well worth actually sitting down and reading. And I mean, carefully reading and thinking about the GMC uh, good medical practice document. I remember starting medical school and being told that we should all go away and read it. I don't think anyone did. Um, but I certainly used that to prepare for the, the situational judgment test that we had to do at the end of medical school for getting into foundation program. And that was a very similar test to the MSRA professional dilemmas exam. And I would say reading through um, good medical practice, that document from the GMC, that's a really good way actually of of just having a think about the different domains that are essentially being tested in the professional dilemmas uh, paper. I would say as well, if you start preparing for that or reading some of the sample questions on the HEE website, or even when you get into the exam, don't freak out if, if you're struggling to find the single best answer when you're doing the sort of ranking questions. Um, it is tricky and often there will be a couple of answers that seem like equally good answers. Everybody finds it hard. Um, just have a think, put yourself in the mindset of, of uh, of the GMC Good Medical Practice document um, and give it your best shot. Um, so I'd just like to finish, I'm almost out of time, but I'll just spend a couple of minutes talking about my experience of starting core training. And I'd just like to say um, congratulations on considering applying for core psychiatry training. I would say it's, it's a, a fantastic programme and I'm not just saying that because I've agreed to, uh, to speak here. Um, I certainly felt having, having done the foundation programme, um, I felt like it's a real step up actually going into core psych training in the sense that there's a, a much, much bigger focus on, on training day to day um, than I experienced during foundation. I learned tons during foundation, but um, it didn't always feel like I was receiving much in the way of, of, of support and training. That's quite different in, in core psych training. Um, you know, a, a real boon when you're training as a psychiatrist is that you have an hour of supervision time with your clinical supervisor every week that's mandated by the royal college and if you're not getting it you can you can raise that and, and it should be sorted for you and that's one-to-one -one time with a consultant with your consultant to talk through um, any issues you might be having uh, any difficult or interesting cases any topic areas that you'd like to discuss you can do workplace-based assessments um, 
it's a really, really brilliant feature of core training and I would say a real strength of the program. Uh, you also have psychotherapy training, so you'll have a half day uh, a week where you'll do some sort of psychotherapy training which changes throughout the, the core training program. Um, and, and you also have some sort of formal teaching program. So here in South Yorkshire, we have a full day of formal teaching every two weeks. Um, so it really breaks the week up actually, you know, the, the parts of the week where you're focusing entirely on your training. Um, there are times where you're, where you're doing clinical work and then there are times when you're reflecting about it and discussing it with your supervisors. Um, and I would say it's, it's really a fantastic program and I, I don't regret for a minute um, coming into the core training uh, program. Um, the only sort of, I was sort of racking my brains trying to think if there were any kind of um, teething problems when I started core training. And the only thing I, I could think of really, and this might be a little bit peculiar to South Yorkshire where I train, but um, the, the scheme here where we are is, is run out of Sheffield. That's kind of the main teaching trust. But we have uh, clinical placements across uh, several sort of neighbouring trusts across the region. And I started in CT1 in, in one of those neighbouring trusts. And, and again, in CT2, I'm in a different uh, neighbouring trust, not in Sheffield. Um, and certainly the, the kind of initial induction at the start of CT1 was focused really on, on the trust that I was going to be working in. So it's more of a kind of, of local level uh, induction. And there wasn't much of an induction in terms of, of actually being inducted into the, the core psych training programme in terms of what's expected of you in the portfolio, um, workplace based assessments, things like that. But again, that could just be a bit of a blind spot locally. And, and certainly if you was fed back to our our. Um, people who run the scheme in Sheffield but it's just just be mindful I, I had a couple of colleagues uh, in my CT1 year who were IMGs uh, and they weren't even aware that they'd not been told um, some of the things that they, they really should have been told um, whereas some of us kind of realized that, that there's some gaps and we kind of proactively uh, sort out that information um, so I, I would say if, if you feel like you've not had a decent induction to the actual local core training scheme and you've just got a sort of local induction to your trust um, email your med ed department when you've started and, and raise any questions that you might have uh, and just check you've not been missed out of any emails or things like that. So that was the only sort of teething problem I could think of. Um, and then just thinking about my, my two IMG colleagues again who I worked with. Um, if you are an IMG and, and you're, you're going to be starting in core training and perhaps if it's if it's your, your first job um, working in the NHS in the UK, it's, it's well worth sort of emailing the med ed department in, in the scheme where, where you end up being given a post to ask if there's any any mentorship opportunities if there are any consultants or other IMGs who are who are further along in training or speciality doctors who can just help to orient you and point you in the right direction when you get started um, I think that's well worth looking into if possible so I think I'm out of time so I'd just like to finish by saying uh, well done for, for thinking about starting uh, applying for core psych training and best of luck um, don't study too hard for the MSRA, but do a bit of prep, unlike me. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jim. And you're staying with us, aren't you, for some of the Q&A as well? Brilliant. Yeah. Great. Thank, thanks very much. I think right balance of don't do too much, but do a bit of preparation. So, um, Chris, Chris, are you joining us as well? I can see you've been hard at work answering the uh, Q&A um, in the background. Lovely to see your face, Chris. Welcome. Thanks so much for being here. So this is Chris, Chris Walsh, who's the current chair of the Psychiatric Trainees Committee. We're really pleased to have him here. And I can see he's been uh, yeah, giving his pearls of wisdom to many of you already. Chris, I noticed that there was a question you wanted to answer live. So do you want to take that one first? There's a few others I've highlighted, but if you want to go first, please do go ahead. Perfect. I, I uh, hello. Nice to see everybody. Uh, um, uh, yes. Yeah, so my name is Chris. I'm um, only recently elected the chair of the RC Psych um, uh, PTC committee. Um, uh, I guess one of the things that's probably important to say at this stage is, is that um, we work a lot with um, the college and the national recruitment in terms of making sure people are represented and um, making sure that um, we're sort of our voices heard and things like that. Um, um, but we also help a lot with just guiding people in the right direction and putting people with um, in the sort of uh, the right place to get the right advice that they need at any time. So if there's anything offline that anybody comes up with today that they're struggling with, if you email PTC support, uh, 
at rcpsych.ac.uk. Uh, we can put you in touch with the right people to answer your questions. Um, so uh, about psychiatry and uh, recruitment or anything related to that. Um, so I accidentally clicked answer this live, but I'm happy to, to answer it live rather than type it. But essentially, um, somebody's asked here about um, choosing a, um, a deanery for training in relation to um, in relation to psychiatry. Um, I guess the, the, the way we would probably look at this is the fact that um, because of a lot of fairly robust processes that exist in the UK, that um, psychiatry training is standardised so that everybody sort of theoretically gets the same experience in terms of um, in terms of the quality of the teaching and the training that they get um, I, I I probably advise people more to think about the choice of deanery based on other things in their life in terms of um, where they might be living to do with sort of family and relationships and hobbies and all the other pillars of of your life that are absolutely essential to sort of uh, keep you propped up during the slightly more difficult parts of training so uh, rather than maybe choosing it based on that unless there was something really specific that you were absolutely keen on from the start of your and um, from the start of your training um uh, for example um uh, we in northern ireland have a massive trauma service and um, because of transgenerational trauma to do with the troubles and um, so that we weirdly have quite a lot of medical psychotherapists and there's a very big network of medical psychotherapy and we have more medical psychotherapy be higher training and posts than, than the rest of the UK so um just so uh, that's why I came back after being a sales doctor for a long time to get one of those posts if I could so uh, sometimes you can make decisions based on that and usually again um having a chat with us we have PTC reps all over the UK so we can always um uh, field those questions a bit um but certainly I'd make my decision based on um what's happened in your life outside of psychiatry because it's pretty standardized Thanks very much, Chris. I would add one thing, though. Um, uh, I, I mean, I have to say, conflict of interest. I did my training in, I went to medical school in Sheffield. I did my training, most of it in South Yorkshire, Leeds and Nottingham. I've clearly not moved very far from where I started. So, I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I and I'm, I'm working in Rotherham now. So um, from somebody who didn't move very far, I think it is also really good to think about um, other places, what they can offer. There are certainly, you mentioned SLAM, the questioner, um, uh, whoever asked, uh, mentioned SLAM, South London, South London Maudsley Trust. And certainly there are certain rotations which are known for their connections to uh, research institutions, um, the Institute of Psychiatry. Manchester is somebody, somewhere else where there's a lot of uh, research going on and Newcastle as well. Um, so there are certain areas um, and certain rotations which if you're interested in academic in a career in academic psychiatry um, they will be that's it is easier to make connections networks um, if you are there and working with those people that's not to say that you can't get involved in research from working somewhere else but it's just a lot more difficult I have to say over the last few years it's become easier because of remote working and setting up meetings no longer means you have to sort of schlep on the train or drive to where you want to go to you can just set up a meeting so that is much easier but if you are if you're set on a career in academic psychiatry it's probably best to try and think about those rotations which have a um, strong research pedigree and you're going to bump into lots of professors in the corridor i have to say that's not the case in rotherham rotherham has got lots of um things to commend it but you're not going to bump, bump into many professors walking down your um kind of uh, walking down the corridor the other thing that uh Allied to what Chris said about choosing things um, outside your sort of outside work and stuff like that, I saw a question about driving. Um, I think it's been answered already. Um, there was a question about um, somebody not being able to drive for medical reasons and what kind of, um, uh, well, not just exceptions, but um, what adjustments would be made. So I've had quite a few trainees who've not been able to drive for medical uh, reasons. I work with two consultants who can't drive for medical uh, reasons. So it's actually not only possible to get a um, post, progress through training, but actually to become a consultant and work as a consultant. It does require a little bit of thought and creativity and um, some, I think, rotations are more sympathetic than others. But in those cases, Think about um, where your base will be, because it often requires um, 
commuting to another town or city within the area, within sort of your three years of core training, and certainly within higher training, you may be expected to um, drive to or move to uh, another city to do a year or six month post. Um, not all rotations will expect you to do that. And certainly the training program director who organizes kind of which jobs you're going to go and do and who gets what job will be a lot more sympathetic, not only for people who can't drive for medical reasons, but those of you who have dependents, those of you who may have recognized disabilities, all of those, um, sort of reasons will mean that you may get jobs closer to home but that's something else to consider about what the geographical reach of the rotation is when you're applying to that deanery um, I mean I don't know what it's like in Northern Ireland Chris and how far you have to go out to but I know certainly somewhere like for example Cornwall you could well be you know or Cornwall Bristol that kind of area you can't commute two and a half, three hours a day. Well, some people can, but it's just not possible. So um, yeah, th bearing that in mind as well when you make your choices. Um, there was another question about the process. Um, Amelia, I know it sort of, it, this is a process question. I'm hoping to take a locum year after FY2. There's lots of questions about whether the uh, MSRA, uh, you can keep, the results, whether you apply this year, next year, whether you can defer, whether if you take it this year, can you defer six months? So lots of questions about sort of deferrals and um, how long you can keep valid results for or when you have to apply. I wonder whether you could um, speak to that if that's okay, please. Yeah, of course. Um, so if you're sitting the MSRA in January 2023, that score can be used for the August 23 intake and the February 24 intake and that's it, it can't go any further. Um, if you're applying for just the February 23, no, February 24 intake, you would have to sit the exam either in January or we'll offer another one in around August, September time this year. Um, but the it's, it's kind of valid for a recruitment year, which runs January to January. Um, but we'll be able to answer that if anyone has any specific queries, they can email us. Um, but yeah, it's only valid for a year. So there's been a couple of questions, I think, about the also application process, about how long the MSRA only application process is going to stick with us for. I'm, I'm not sure, Amelia, whether you can, you know more about that. I, I can speak to it a little bit, but you might want to go first. Uh, we, we don't anticipate there being any changes. It was obviously introduced um, sort of as a response to the pandemic. But before that, we'd been using the MSRA as a bypass score anyway. So people who scored a certain mark didn't have to attend an interview. And um, we have the evidence to, sh to show that it, it does map with what results we used to have from our interviews uh, when they did take place face to face. So we know it's a good measure. So we, we expect we will continue with it, as definitely for the February 24 intake um, and probably beyond. I mean, I think, I mean, Chris, you'll be aware, or Jim, both of you will probably be aware there was a lot of dissatisfaction when it moved to that model and no interviews, um, which I can understand. Um, I don't know if kind of the PTC has a view on whether it should move back to interviews. As Amelia said, I think it's a discussion that's ongoing but I don't think there's going to be any changes for the near future. Chris, are you aware of anything or? No, yeah, my understanding is that the, the um, I think there was even, I think um, there was something on some little announcement on Twitter about it recently or something, but anyway, they, there's no plan certainly from the head. I was at the recruitment, um, national recruitment strategy meeting last week and there was no sort of um, definitive plans to change it. It's probably worth mentioning just based on some of the questions that are are on the, the thing that, um, that um, England, Scotland and Wales all are part of the HEE national recruitment, which was being discussed today and has been sort of right by Amelia. And um, but the Northern Ireland process is different, so um, it's through um, Northern Ireland Mental uh, Mental even use other word Medical Dental Training Association or NIMTA. Um, and the the actual process is fairly similar. They've moved to MSRA and removed the interview. Um, as it used to have that, but um, the it's just that it's a separate application via Oriel. Um, but the actual application itself is different on Oriel in the way that 
are free text boxes for CV related items and things like that. So it's a slightly different application process. Um, and um, exactly as you said, Dr. Das, there's been lots of um, sort of like issues to do with dissatisfaction and things like that. And the fact that people are sort of um, scoring differently um, on different application systems and things. Um, but um, certainly for now, it's, it's, it's not going to change in the next while, I don't think from what I've heard. No, I think it's 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 not a it's been not been put to bed as such. I think there are, this is still an active discussion, but I can't see that it will be changing in the near future. If I'm being realistic, so um, there was a question about less than full time training, which I also said I was going to answer live, just because it requires a little bit more explanation. I think there's a lot of interest in less than full time training, and whereas. Um, I would say five, 10 years ago was quite a laborious process. You could only go less than full time if you had babies or a sort of a specific reason, health reason to be less than full time. Actually, more and more people are choosing to work less than full time for many, for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, you know, you can talk about life, work life balance or yeah, a variety of different reasons. So yes, you can choose to go less than full time after starting training. Um, priority will be given to people who have uh, dependents or um, who have a caring role, or as I said, who have developed health reasons, but um, you can still apply. In, I think in most deaneries, it will be seriously considered. Um, the only times I guess, it might be declined is because TPDs, this is speaking from experience, have really, really complicated grids and jobs and sort of job allocations to fill out. Um, and depending on how less than full time you want to be, whether you want to be 80 percent, 60 percent, 50 percent, those kind of things, um, it might be difficult or challenging to meet your exact requirements. So the answer to your question is yes. You can request to go to less than full time after applying for full time um, and it will be seriously considered. Um, it might not be immediately granted, but it will be definitely seriously considered um, uh, by the training programme director when you start. So I hope that's answered your question about less than full time. I'm just looking through to see if there's any other live questions. Have, have any of you spotted anything else? I'm just looking. There's. Sorry, Dr. Das, can yeah. I just add something about less than full time? It's just some reassurance that if you've requested that in your application form, that has no impact on the offer process at all. The offer process treats everybody equally and obviously it relates to the, uh, the MSRA rank. But the fact if someone wants to go less than full time or if they want to defer the start date, that has no impact on the offer process. So there was also a question about somebody interested in CAMS and LD run through training who'd also already done their um, paper A and paper B and about to sit their cask. So um, uh, Claire and the rest of the careers team, you might be in a better position to answer that because if they pass their cask and it, it might be better that they go for higher training rather than then going through all of core training if um depending on obviously what equivalency they've got in their um country of origin so Claire I wonder whether you could maybe follow that up with that questioner um and there's been quite a few questions about using past experience uh to reduce core training duration um so those are often on a case by case obviously you need um at least 12 months post registration experience and 24 months altogether um and that is at the point of starting training not when you apply because obviously lots of people apply several months before um but uh does you know working as a staff a staff grade doctor career grade doctor clinical fellow there'll have been lots of different experiences that people have put in the questions um a, a couple of sort of broad uh points about that it depends on where you did it 
how long ago you did it, whether these were recognized um, training posts or whether you had um, to supervision, whether there was anything, whether you collected any evidence um, as a, in a portfolio, um, whether you have how much evidence you have about some of the kind of training things you might need to tick off as a core trainee. For example, attendance at Ballant Group, um, uh, participation in a short case, long case, all those things. I'm going to look to Jim and Chris now because I'm talking about things that I've not done for about 15, 20 years. <laughs> You'll know much more than me what you need to tick off in terms of ARCP. So it's really about whether you can meet any of those ARCP requirements from your non-training posts as to whether it'll be reduced or not. So um, Jim, is, is, have I missed anything out there? Chris, both of you, do you want to carry on from there? Um, I guess the so my kind of career pathway was I was a sales doctor for eight years after F2 before I went into core training uh, so I took quite a lot of advice at the time about whether it was a possibility to go in at ST4 the formal advice um, that I was given um, which still stands because we recently did somebody going through a similar thing was effectively that um, there's certain things have to be done inside training and other things that can be done outside training um, so the thing that has to be done inside training is the um, psychotherapy competencies which as you said is the and grip short case long case and um, which in usually takes about 24 months to complete um those pieces um and then um you outside of training or inside training you can complete your rc psych exams and then inside or outside training you can complete all of the competencies that are required um for you to be able to progress to st4 so those competencies historically with the ilos and um, the intended learning outcomes and then with the change to the new curriculum are the ehlo so high intensity learning outcomes outcomes um, or higher learning outcomes whatever they're called um so effectively somebody who had um done um their exams outside of training and could demonstrate all of those competencies based on their work as a SAS doctor and um, could get um could apply for an ST job and um, provided that they had done um, the psychotherapy competencies within core training so what that really means is is that usually if you haven't done your psychotherapy competencies within core training you'd have to apply for core training rather than ST go in for ST four however if you can get it all done within the first two years years and um, you can apply for an st4 job and shave a year off your core training as they kind of so that kind of applies to to sales doctors there's a couple of people have asked about this in in the questions here thanks chris thank you um amelia this is um a, a, a little bit more sort of he recruitment focused question is um for ST1 CAMS posts, I think they're referring to the run, run through uh, scheme. Oriel states that it's solely based on MSRA. However, the HE website listed essential and desirable criteria, which will be evaluated by our application form and interview. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's that's just a mix up there. Um, no, I'm, I'm not sure either, but to confirm it will just be MSRA only, but I, I can have a look into that concern. Well. Lovely. Thanks very much, Amelia. Um, I think, and also, yeah, but while we're on a uh, run through, is there a list on the HE website? Um, well, I, I guess, uh, is there a list somewhere of all the places where they have, offer CAMS and run through training? Unfortunately not. The post will only be in England because Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland don't uh -huh. do the run through pilot um but at this stage we we sort of lump all the ct1 st1 posts together because uh -huh. uh, it is quite vague but further along in the process february sort of time when applicants can preference them it will very clearly say st1 and ct1 okay lovely thanks very much amelia i think it's ld as well L, they're running ld and ld pilot as well uh, based on the success of the uh, cams run through training um I am. There's a few questions, I guess, from um, international graduates, I guess, about um, CREST, about English qualifications, things like that. I wonder whether I can leave that to you and Ben and the careers team to um, advise them properly, um, as in, I could make an answer, but I'm not sure I'd be entirely correct because it can be really confusing, can't it, about the rules and regulations that uh, govern these things. Um, right. Oh, 
And when can we apply for training posts starting in February 2024? Um, are there two MSRA dates during one recruitment year? Yes. So for the February 24 intake, you would need to submit a new application probably in July, August time. I'm not sure about the timetables yet. That'll be published on our website soon. Um, and then you'd be invited to sit the MSRA in probably August or September, or you could choose to have your January 23 scores transferred up to the next round. Um, but you would have to submit a completely new application if you want to be considered for February 24. Lovely. Thanks, Amelia. And I think there was a question, there's a question there about the second, the February round having a lower applica application post ratio. And I know, Chris, you answered one about the February sort of rounds, didn't you? Um, I don't know whether, I don't know what you said, but I don't want to uh, contradict. It usually you. is a much smaller round because obviously those applicants are out of sync. Whereas mm. for the August intake, we have people who've just come out of foundation and it's sort of the natural cycle of it. Um, so yeah, this, August 23 round will have a larger number of, of posts than the February intake. Yeah, I, it's a lot more variable yes. is what I'd say from a, I guess, um, I used to be a core training programme director many years ago, and it's very variable how many posts go into the February round, um, because it often depends on how many people have passed the CASC in January. So are the, the CASC, the postgraduate psychiatric qualification uh, has two sittings in September and January but how that works out is that that then means that um, people who pass both the September and January are eligible to apply for higher training from February so it's sort of captured in that go so it very much depends um, on how many people are successful in both those rounds uh, as to how many posts are then very suddenly freed up for a February start date. So um, it's, I, I, yeah, I, I think it's certainly worth considering, but also you might want to go and do, you know, uh, an F3 year, might want to go traveling, want to go and do something fun for a few months in between foundation. Again, I, I probably shouldn't be saying this on a application webinar, but yeah, you it might not want to go straight from foundation into core training, although you should do. I'm going to get told off if I say that uh, much more. Any more questions? Uh, if you please. Um, I'm a UK graduate doing the foundation programme in the UK, but from a non-English speaking country. Do I need to resit the ILTS to prove my English competency? I don't think so, do they? Or Amelia? Um, well, if they're doing their foundation programme, I imagine they'll have GMC registration by the end of it. Um, full GMC registration by F2 rather sorry um so we wouldn't need any further evidence there's no need to pay and resit that exam if you've got full gmc registration that's enough evidence of your english language competency lovely okay. thanks amelia so i can see we're uh, at 4 57 i know that um several people need to leave a bang on time so i just want to say thank you so much to all our speakers and all uh, everyone else from the college who's been involved uh, in the background as well. They've not come on uh, cameras, but thank you so much to Emma and Claire and Catherine and Catherine, both Catherines, uh, for, for, for everything that you put into this. This couldn't run without you. It's run smoothly. Um, I've not had to accidentally unmute to mute myself a single time because of all your organization. Um, thank you so much, Amelia. It's really, really helpful for having you and Ben here to help out as well. Um, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jim, both of you for coming. Uh, and I would echo uh, Chris's um, sort of comments right at the beginning. The Psychiatric Trainees Committee is really, really active. It's really involved across um, all four nations, the devolved nations as well. Um, and they're really enthusiastic, really welcome new people uh, who want to join and if you've got any questions I'm sure Chris you'll be happy to answer them if they can be sent through to you but if that's okay I, I sort of hesitated before I said yes yeah, send them all through to Chris <laughs> um, but they are super helpful I know from experience so um, please do get in touch get in touch with the careers team um, any other sort of process issues we'll get back to you the certificates will be sent out in about a week or so and I hope to see you all 
uh, in psychiatry uh, very, very soon. Good luck with the application process. Have a good evening and bye to you all.